So I'm with uh, Helen Minnis. Do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, John. Um, so yes, I'm I'm Helen Minnis. I'm a I'm a, a member of Glasgow Quaker Meeting. I'm a professor of child and adolescent psychiatry, which means I'm a scientist, and I've also got a clinical role. Um, I love to sing, and I think that's enough about me as an introduction. It's enough about you. We're <laughs> here to talk about you. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit more about your work? Like, what does that actually involve on a sort of daily basis? Yeah, what I love about my work is that it's different every day, it's different every month, and it's different every year, because as a clinical academic, I'm basically bidding for grants to do studies, but they're clinical studies. So at the moment, I'm mainly focusing on randomised control trials of interventions for abused and neglected children. So I've always had a focus on the mental health problems of abused and neglected children. And my clinical work is, is focused on that as well. Mm. So it's it's I love it because... It involves lots of different kinds of people. We have to work with social workers, judges, psychiatrists, people who've used services, including parents who've had their children removed, um, foster carers. It's really interesting work. Wow. Um, and how does that, in like that? That's like quite heavy stuff. How do you do you do that? Like on a daily basis, do you have like a way that you uh, say supported in that work? Oh, it's, it's strange actually because people tend to think oh my goodness it's really heavy and it is but I think the thing about being a scientist is that you're working for change mm. so there's something really positive about that and even just making a little tiny little change in something feels really positive so for example we started a study oh gosh we started work on it about 10 years ago and it's an infant mental health intervention for abused and neglected children coming into foster care and their families. And through a long chain of events, that really has influenced the Scottish government. Amongst other things, I'm not saying it was just us, but it's, it's really helped the Scottish government think about providing funding for infant mental health services generally across Scotland. And that's really satisfying. So it's taken years and it does take a long time. It's not fast. But that's the positive side. And then also just working with a really fantastic group of people. You know, people who are in this field are generally not arrogant, generally in it for the same reasons you know, for the children and the families. And then also I think the thing dropped with me a few years ago that, that this is my way of working for peace because I think that violence is an infectious disease that comes from harshness, harshness in families, harshness in the community and so actually focusing really carefully on trying to reduce harshness is is my way of working for peace yes it's almost like a form of peace work really isn't it mm -hmm. i think it is yeah so in, in some ways it was a bit of a relief because i thought well i don't have to necessarily do lots of peace work this is my bit <laughs> i know i i i'm really yeah like any kind of broad interpretation of that of peace i think is really helpful i mean of course got stuff like you know structural violence and all that really fits into into that kind of stuff doesn't it um, what was it george fox you know the root the, the roots of all war is that was that the, the word it, it's you've really got to get into the roots yeah which which i guess is what you're doing on a daily basis so that's yeah. that's it's really fascinating stuff what's it like with like having to constantly bid for grants and stuff like that must be quite difficult though as well like in terms of the stress of, of having yeah. to keep bidding for things I mean I'm, I'm very lucky because I enjoy the creative process of that so I actually enjoy trying to kind of formulate an idea and justify how you're going to try and tackle it so it, it's tough in the sense that you don't always get the funding and but at least I don't feel that the time has been wasted because I quite enjoy owning it and putting it back you know again and, and getting it better the next time and sometimes turning it into something else um so I don't mind that bit of the job except for the fact that um I've realized recently that the system of, of awarding grants has got its problems and this is actually something that I've discussed with some of the big funding bodies, and they've been very, very open to this. But there are quite a lot of kind of unconscious biases that go on 
there, particularly when you get to the stage of bidding for big, kind of exciting programmes of work, um, then sometimes these really kind of subtle but devastating issues of bias can come in where there are certain people who are kind of thought to be scientists. And yeah. I, I don't look like that. That's interesting. So I guess <laughs> it's like, if we're going to give, you know, millions of pounds or something to a person, it's going to be, you know, we want to, we want it to be a safe person. So it's going to be a, an old white man. <laughs> Potentially. Yes, potentially. That's potentially. And, and it's interesting because I think I've been quite successful with funding for randomized control trials. And I can't complain, I've done well in terms of, of you know getting funding and being able to do research and build a team. But but the thing about randomized control trials is they are very procedural. So you know, if you write the bid in a particular way, it's obvious that you're that you know what you're doing. It's more when you're trying to do something that's a bit more out of the box, a bit more exciting, a bit more frontiers of science, to be honest, then it's a bit more challenging, I think. See, I, we've, we've had conversations about this before, and there's an interesting thing there about how science is supposed to be pushing boundaries yeah. and uh, ex- sort of exploring the unknown. It's quite a good um, quote, I think, in Faith and Practice, actually, about how that connects with Quakers, uh, wanting to explore the unknown. Um, it's an interesting, is it, I want to say paradox, but I guess it's kind of like a, a paradox. Yeah, maybe it is a paradox that if you then are not, your the biases are not enabling you to listen to the different voices, you kind of, everyone's losing out from that. That's right. I think it, it what you said there made me think that there are known unknowns. <laughs> I think I might be quoting a really embarrassing American politician there, but, um, but in a sense, I think, think the danger is that we end up in a very kind of traditional box and we don't even realize that we're there and it's often people who have a different perspective that are likely to see wait a minute there's an obvious answer to this I guess guess the COVID-19 pandemic is a really good example so there was a, a bit of a scandal to be honest where two of the big funding bodies had put I wasn't involved in this but two of the big funding bodies put a lot of money into trying to understand why um, black and minority ethnic um, people were uh, seemed to be much more at risk of COVID-19. And there was not a single black scientist that led any of the grants. And it seemed to take months before people penny dropped. But one of the reasons that's just blindingly obvious is that more black and brown people are driving buses and sitting in terminals at the underground and changing people's underwear in nursing homes, doing those kind of um, poorly paid jobs that just put them in the line of infection. And even in the NHS, that's also been true. And in fact, it's been, the realization of that I think has been really positive because for example, the Royal College of Psychiatrists produced this fantastic report about racism in, the NHS and really just demonstrating all of the different subtle steps in which that can work. You know, you know, you may be a black nurse and may feel unable to say, look, I really don't think that's a very safe task and don't have good enough PPE. But it's those subtle biases that maybe make a black nurse feel unable to speak out about that. So in some ways, I think this, this last couple of years has been quite helpful in just breaking a bit of that open and helping people understand that these things have real health consequences for everyone because obviously that affects white people too I mean you know the, if the infection rates keep circulating in the population it's not good for any of us. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good example isn't it and of course you know we've seen that with um, variants and things like that like the you know we, we can it can then get very quickly geopolitical but you know yeah hoarding vaccines absolutely well, coronavirus doesn't care it's it's going to spread exactly. everywhere else that you've stopped the vaccines going to oh exactly do you know if i mean the you know the oxford team waived their intellectual property for low-income countries you know if all the vaccine manufacturers have done that you might not have an Omicron variant i mean that's maybe a bit simplistic but There's some truth there i think particularly in this country at least my experience even as someone who is in their 20s is you're taught that racism is 
a bunch of people that hate another bunch of people mm. not that it's a series of structural issues and biases and that sure. everybody is part of that system yes um, all of us including me how does that do you think relates to quakers and before maybe before we answer that question do you want to kind of give your like what's maybe maybe we should go back and i'll just be like how do you become a quaker <laughs> what's your quaker experience Helen? Yeah, so my Quaker experience is really quite interesting because my mum was a Quaker. My mum was white, my dad was black. My mum was a Quaker, my dad was a high church Anglican, but an agnostic, who believed in God, to be honest. And so I had a choice. And I used to come to Quakers sometimes as a child with my mum. I really liked it. I really loved the radical old people. Do you know? Yeah. <laughs> I really loved the fact that they were just really, really cool, kick-ass, elderly Quakers just not kind of towing the line. <laughs> when I was 13, I had quite a kind of powerful um, experience where I was sitting, I remember it clearly, I was sitting watching the telly and it was the Soweto uprising that I was 13 at the time. This would be 76, I think. And that shows how old I am. And there were all these young, young people out there in the streets um, protesting peacefully at that point, but it became violent later. About the fact that they were being expected to, to basically conduct all of their education in the language of their oppressor. Mm. And I was absolutely, I just was horrified by this. And I thought, do you know what? If I was a young black person in South Africa, I might well want a gun. And it was such a horrible feeling. And I thought, that means I can't be a Quaker. I'm obviously not a very peaceful person. And so for years, I just kind of distanced myself from Quakers because I thought it wasn't that I wasn't a pacifist because I did, I did all that time, I didn't believe that war was ever a good solution. But on the other hand, I thought if I had been one of those young people, I might not have been able to stop myself. And then years later, it was just when me and my husband were about to get married, we were thinking of having a Quaker wedding and we started going to Streatham meeting at that point. And I had a chat with a family friend who is an Iraqi refugee. She's been in Britain for years, but she was, she was imprisoned by the Ba'athist party and tortured. And she explained very clearly that it's about working for peace and that being peaceful is more difficult for some people than others. And then I felt, all right, I'm just, I can be as Quaker. You know, I'm, so that was a bit of a revelation to me. I realised that being, you know, holding the peace testimony doesn't necessarily um, mean that everybody in the world is going to be able to be peaceful because some people are really stuck in a corner and we need to be compassionate about that. There's an interesting thing there, isn't there, about <clears throat> the way that sometimes within Quakerism in this country, peace is projected and perceived. Um, <clears throat> If you are very privileged, it is quite easy for you to say, let's all be peaceful, which is a stark difference to if you are, you know, say for example, some of the people involved in the London riots or whatever, going back 10 years ago. I'm not saying that that's a great thing, but I, there's a lot of kind of like, oh, well, that's like, as you say, oh, that's obviously wrong because it's violence or like this kind of quite a simplistic narrative that's that right. I think can be really alienating actually that's to right. people. I think that's right. And it, I was just thinking it's a real parallel in my daily work because one of the, the trials that we're running, it's a trial of a, an intervention for families who have abused and neglected their children, where a judge has you know, adjudicated that this has happened. And the woman who, the clinical psychologist who leads the, that team, um, it was an absolute revelation to her. She never worked directly to therapeutically to try and help families in that situation change enough to get their, their children back. And what she realized literally within three weeks was that virtually every single one of those parents were trying to do their best for their children. And actually the stresses that were under were, that they were under were stresses that none of us could imagine. Do you know what your drug dealer trying to get your, your door down? and or even if you didn't have a drug dealer the drug dealer upstairs trying to kick your door down um you know, suddenly being sanctioned so that you don't have any money and you don't have any way to feed your children until you find the food bank i mean do you know, 
Well, you, you kind of think, if, if any of us were under that degree of stress, terrible things might happen. And it's that thing of um, trying to walk, trying to really walk in other people's shoes and realise that, that life is just really, really not that easy for a lot of people. But it's a lot easier for us, so we better not look down our noses. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Earlier, you were talking about how <clears throat> structural racism affects everyone. It, how, how do you see it affecting Quakers? So I think, I think it's really, it really leads on from what we've just been saying. I think, I think it's about race, but it's not just about race, it's also about class and I think um, the way that Quakers has, has developed over the last few hundred years uh, as, a, as a group, and I mean, this is not true of all Quakers at all, but as a group, we tend to be quite well-educated, we tend to be relatively wealthy and, you know, and I think it's, it, <laughs> It's such a difficult one to actually put your finger on, but if most of the people that you share a spiritual space with are similar to you in that way, then I guess it's back to the thing we were talking about, about science earlier, where, you know, it's the known unknowns. So my early experience of, of Quakers as a child was, I loved the radicalism. I just loved the kind of thinking outside the box. But in a sense, it maybe ends up that our box is not that big because it doesn't include really a big, big sample of the rest of the world. You know, ironically, um, the largest number of Quakers is in East Africa, but there's not much mixing with British Quakers. So with British Quakers, um, we tend to be overwhelmingly white and middle class um, and, I, and I don't want to say this in a critical way because you know I had a white mum <laughs> and, uh, and I'm middle class so I was like other Quakers as any other Quaker you know but it's for me the question is how do we think outside the box if the box is quite small yeah so we almost think we're out thinking outside the box but we're still in a very small space yeah. um and I suppose we I guess, yeah, I guess I suppose just like science is missing on potential answers or discoveries, Quakers miss misses on perspective and spiritual insights and that's right. All that's right. I mean, I remember I remember being a leavener when I was a, a teenager, you know, the Quaker theatre group. And uh, this was in my late teens actually, and we were doing a, a review about unemployment. And I was at, you know, I was living in Glasgow. I I think I year at school but I had friends that were at university I had many friends who were so poor they couldn't buy a winter coat <laughs> and there just didn't seem to be any understanding uh, among that particular group of mainly London and Birmingham friends because I just don't think I don't think the south of England was as economically strapped at the time as, as Scotland was you know, it was a huge rate of unemployment and it was just a really unpleasant experience thinking I just there was a suggestion that we should sing a song about when you're when you're finding things difficult go and have a bath and it's like well you cannot have a bath if you don't have money to feed the meter you know and so I think in some ways it is that it's just like how do we actually try and hear the experience of, of a wider range of people because if we do that we we I suspect many, many Quakers really not only would, would want to be help, collaboratively helpful, but would actually have quite a lot of um, a lot to offer in terms of networks and you know and, and finances, I suppose. Yeah, it's interesting to spin that as well from from just the spiritual perspective, but also to like the practical perspective. I suppose, like you were talking about with um, you know the the vaccines earlier well sorry with coronavirus earlier and it affecting black and brown people they're not realizing the solution was obvious um you know actually if we're dealing with global issues like war and climate change and whatnot like we're not equipped to do that on our own um we're not i think that's exactly it john it's we're not equipped to do that on our own and i think um i think britain generally one of the things that, that makes me cringe about being british is that i think 
as as a as a nation, we're not very good at uh, believing that other people have things to teach us. Mm. Um, I think the, the 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 pandemic has actually made many British people think that. My, my daughter was working in Taiwan, and honestly, they, they apparently would have been really happy for us to use the track and trace system from the beginning. They only had six deaths in the whole pandemic. <laughs> but I just think our, I think our scientists and our policy leaders just couldn't imagine that someone in Taiwan. Yeah, yeah. How yeah. could they have to teach us? So in a sense, I think we need to kind of take on board that even though most Quakers would, would cringe at the thought that we were like that, um, I think we maybe need to realise that we probably have been a bit like that subtly without even realising and that we just really, really do have an awful lot to learn from other, from other people and other churches, other ways of doing things. Well, it, it again goes back to that, you know, being products of, of a system, you know, even if Quakers are, have been opposed to war and colonialism and whatever, we still live in a society that is absolutely still the product of that um and particularly like the british mindset like you know the amount of people who in 2021 still think the british empire is a good thing could, could come back and as you say and that leads us blind to like oh well of course people in taiwan wouldn't come up with a solution and of course we shouldn't need to listen to this group because we're british we're the best in the world <laughs> yeah like, i mean britain, I is, britain is full of asylum seeking and refugee doctors extremely highly trained we've got big gaps in our nhs but unfortunately our systems are such that we won't accept qualifications from other universities you know, yeah especially not universities that are not ex colonies so there, there's a lot of that and i think um i think there are a lot there are don't get me wrong there are a lot of quakers who have known that for a long long time and have really tried to put themselves in, in places where they're working collaboratively with with people in in low-income countries or in situations that are very different. So I don't want to say that we're not doing any of that. But then in some ways, I guess, it's quite a kind of exciting, liberating realization that actually that probably is a really important solution. So we need to be doing an awful lot more of what we've been doing in that sense. It's also about naming it and being mindful of it. It's not about us being like, oh, we're so terrible or, Oh, I'm. I don't fall into that category. It's like this is this is the, the the air we're breathing in, right? Like we need to know what we're breathing in, what we're moving around in, so that we can we can be aware of it. And I think, how do you oh, how do you feel about the fact that so often Quakers end up? Um, as I say so often Quakers. I have seen some Quakers get quite defensive and upset about this, and 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 I guess white people in general feeling like a real guilt about this type of conversation, and then kind of end up ending up in a spiral. Do you think there's a there's a risk of that? Also? Yeah, oh yeah. I think that's really the big danger because you know we could spend so much time shaming ourselves, and I think shame. I actually think guilt is quite an active emotion. If you feel guilty, you feel that like, I'm going to do something about it. If you feel shame, it's just like pulling a big gun. Um, one of those big metal grills down over your, you know, you just want to sit in the corner and just go, I, I, I just feel like I don't know what to do about that. So I think that's a really, really important thing to try and get over. How do we stop just kind of collapsing into a, a, a situation of shame? I think that's a real danger for all of us. I mean, I had this chat with Paul Parker during COP26. Yeah. And we ended up talking about, um, you know, there's been a lot of criticism about about William Penn, and I was I was kind of saying, you need to acknowledge we need to acknowledge the the, the failings of our Quaker ancestors, but at the same time, I just had this horrible feeling that in a couple of hundred years' time, somebody's going to be criticizing me for the fact that I I bought my clothes without an eye to to whether they were being sewn by a child. But that can be really paralyzing because you think, well, what on earth can I do about that? One of the things that I think COP26 in Glasgow really made me realise was that people came to Glasgow who were willing to give us ideas about what to do about that. Particularly, there were some amazing um, young activists um, from Indigenous communities. And, you know, there was, a, there was a video that they had all put together, and it was just full of really constructive suggestions. So, in a sense, maybe one of the things is to realise that all the answers. Most of the answers don't need to come from us. Most of the answers will be out there. Um, we just need to, to have our ears open, I suppose. Yeah. 
that's that is and that is very liberating and and fits quite nicely with Quakers I do you know sitting and waiting in silence like we should be a listening people shouldn't we really yeah I mean I think our, our Quaker our Quaker methods should be perfect for this it's just it's maybe just realizing that if we do that we might really move forward much more quickly mm. and that there's that is, we shouldn't be afraid of it and we shouldn't be in so much shame that we don't do it because let's face it you know none, none of us are we're, we're all we've all been complicit there's nothing we can do about that there's no point beating ourselves up about it have you been involved in anything specifically with your local meeting, engaging them in this kind of conversation? Yeah, so we had a, um, a friend in Glasgow who resigned his membership because of, of racism and, and it actually really galvanised the, the elders. You know, the, I, I was a part of the group of elders at the time um, and we, we saw this as a really important issue to do with the spiritual life of the meeting, so very much our bag. And I was just delighted at how I was the only um, black elder. But everyone really, really took this on. And we had storytelling workshops where um, friends from, from the Glasgow meeting and also West of Scotland area meeting shared their stories about, about racism and, and exclusion. It was incredibly powerful process and it made me feel it made me feel really hopeful that um that white friends are are up for this discussion so this is a bit it's work that's very much ongoing and we, we were just uh, actually meeting later in the week in the same group we've got we've got a white privilege group um just thinking about how we can feed things in within the west of scotland in preparation for the sports more lecture really so um, it feels like a small but powerful local local thing but really has felt very I felt very upheld by it and um, I've been delighted at how people have really have really wellied in in a very positive way it's not it's not me that's leading it you know which is just lovely because this is not that just this this shouldn't be led by by black friends and hardly any of us um and, and what, what's been really lovely for me in the Glasgow process is that it isn't being led by black friends. It's, it's you know, Glasgow's overwhelmingly white and there's a group of, of white friends that have really got this and they're like, we're not letting this go. We're going to hang on to it like a yappy dog because we need to change. Cool. That kind of brings me nicely onto my final question, which is if somebody is watching this and thinking, oh, this, I'm definitely going to go to this fourth more lecture, it's 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 a while off what would be the kind of one thing you would you would say you would as a lecturer you would really like them to do before then i would really like them to have some kind of um learning group or workshop or something in their meeting in their local meeting and just think about some of these issues and i think i would want to see how you would do that or exactly what you would discuss because i think it'll depend on what's happening locally you know i was on a bym panel last year and all of the other people who spoke were white friends and some of the things they were talking about were doing in the meetings really radical really forward-looking it was really inspiring so i would just say think locally about think together locally about this issue in a way that seems relevant to you and then come to the lecture with an open mind and hopefully in the lecture we can think together about next steps. And also, I mean, it would be, I, f I feel like it's a bit cheeky doing a plug for this, but there is also, uh, if you're finding maybe that you, your local meeting isn't equipped or you um, want to explore it on your own, there are woodwork courses and there is also, uh, we can, we can actually come in and help run sessions on this in local meetings as uh, there's also loads of stuff out there, BYM, loads of stuff out there that's non-Quaker stuff. There's loads of resources. So yeah, a really, a really encouraging call to action there. Thank you. And thank you for your time, Helen. Well, it's been a pleasure. <laughs>